Hi there, my name is Phil and I'm a senior lecturer in astrophysics at the University of Lincoln and in this video I wanted to have a look at exocomets and how they can be detected with the transit method. Now you're probably more familiar with exoplanets and how they're detected with the transit method but you can detect exocomets using the same method. They look slightly different though. But before we go to that, it's just worth mentioning that in my members section actually I have lots of extra videos that are not available on the YouTube channel at the moment. What I typically do is I record two to four months worth of videos in advance and then I will slowly release those. So if you're interested in those then you can check them out on the members section or actually on the Patreon as well, as well as lots of other advantages as well. So going forward onto this video, Exocomets, exoplanets, they're basically comets and planets that orbit other stars. We use the exo part to say that it's an extrasolar, which means it's not orbiting our sun, it's outside of the solar system. So exocomets in this context here are just comets around other stars. Now, comets in our solar system, at least, are the icy remains from the early formation of the solar system. So this is kind of what's been left over from the formation process. They're very cold, icy objects. They typically exist much further away from the sun, but they do come inwards. They're on quite elliptical orbits, and when they come inwards, that's when we really see them as an actual comet. They actually develop this coma, and they actually some of the materials vaporize, you get, you get this kind of gas and iron tail and dust tail, which is what gives these really nice long tails, which is very characteristic of a comet. So in, this, in our solar system, at least, the Oort cloud is a spherical cloud of icy objects or comets, and it exists right on the outer part of the sun's gravitational influence. So it goes right up to the edge of that, really. And that extends about... 2,000 to 200,000 AU, where one AU is the average distance between the Earth and the Sun. So this extends a long way out from the actual Sun. And these are all beyond all of our planets, a long way out. And it, there's trillions and trillions of objects there, or we expect there to be. It hasn't actually directly been observed. I should probably point this out. This is ex uh, a more theoretical idea. Uh, it's expected to be there, but we haven't directly observed this Oort cloud. So there's a bit of uncertainty on how big it is and the exact composition of it. But nonetheless, it's the outer part of our solar system and where long period comets are thought to e exist or come from. So it's also expected that other stars have Oort clouds as well, their own versions of Oort clouds where they've got these comet-like objects around the outside of them. So we expect other stars to have these spherical clouds of comets around them. Now, as stars move through space, they do move past each other, they get closer to each other, they're further away, and they can gravitationally disrupt each other. And because those comets on these spherical clouds are quite a long way from the gravitational influence of the stars, it's quite easy to disrupt them. And you can alter their orbits quite easily. So they don't need to have massive, significant interactions, but something moving by could do that. And what does it do? Well, it will alter their orbits and it makes them highly elliptical. So stars passing by one another can actually make these objects very elliptical. And that means that they go very close to their stars. They're going to go inwards. And the same thing happens with the solar system, actually. So we see that as well. So that's one mechanism where you can actually produce a comet where it's been sent inwards from the outer parts. But also, it's thought that all young systems, so these are systems that are newly formed, maybe even still forming planets, that they will undergo brief, violent episodes of instability. Now, why does that actually occur? Well, during the formation process, you have these kind of disks of material where planets are still forming from, they're still kind of growing from them. You've got smaller objects in there as well. So it's a collection of all different range of sizes, basically. But once the biggest objects there, these terrestrial planetesimals, they're not really planets at the moment, they're kind of baby planets, planetesimals, we would call them. Once they reach around about a thousand kilometers in size, gravitationally, they start to interact with the smaller objects and they can actually scatter them they can send them inwards it causes an instability so we expect in these younger systems that we would expect to see quite a few of these comet-like objects so in young systems debris rich systems with large planets that are still forming we would expect comets to be quite common common so if we looked at those young systems we would expect to find quite a few comets so they should be there 
But how do we actually detect them? Well, first, we need to just quickly revisit the transit method. I'm guessing if you're here watching this video, you're probably familiar with it anyway. So if you are, then just skip a few minutes ahead. So the transit method is where a planet passes in front of its star as viewed from Earth and it will block out some of that light. So when it blocks out the light, the star gets dimmer. And what we get is this kind of nice U-shaped dip in brightness of the star from a planet. If, if it's a binary star, then actually it looks slightly different. And if it's a different object, it can look different as well. But a planet, you'd expect it to be this kind of symmetric U-shaped dip in, in brightness, basically. It's a fairly straightforward mechanism to understand. Now, if we watch that multiple times, so you had transit one, transit two, transit three, we would probably expect those to be symmetric with little variation between them. Now, if you've seen some of my other videos where I've discussed transit timing variations, transit depth variation, duration variation, all those sort of things, you can get asymmetric transits and you, they can vary from each one to the next one. But I'm talking more generally here. Generally, they'll be symmetric if it's a single planet going across its star each time. They're not going to be much varied from it and they would typically be symmetric. Now, if you've got a comet, it's no longer symmetric. It becomes asymmetric instead. So we've got this kind of comet with a nucleus and then a long extended tail behind it. When that passes in front of a star instead, we get these unusual looking asymmetric or skewed transits that we have here. So it's clearly very asymmetric now. Now this is an example of a star which actually had, I think it was six significant asymmetric dips in flux or brightness. And this star was KIC 3542116. Not a very exciting name, they never are really. And this is the light curve for four years. Now the light curve is just the brightness of the star or the flux given out from the star as a function of the time. So this is four years worth here. And on this plot, there are six denoted by D and then a number. And that gives you essentially the, the day number that it occurred on because the bottom or the X axis is actually days. So it gives you when it occurred. And when you zoom in on those, is that's what we saw on the previous slide. They are asymmetric in shape. So this star showed six of those. Now, the three largest ones are shown here. Now, typically, this is blocked out between 0.12 and 0.15% of the actual brightness of the star. So they're not particularly deep. Well, they're relatively deep. We can see them quite well. The signal-to-noise ratio is pretty good, actually. And they last about a day, which is relatively long, actually. And each of those transits there is centered around three days' worth of observation. So the, the kind of bluey dots there are an individual image and brightness that's been calculated from that. And then the red line is the best fit to that from some model. Now, if you look at the three smaller ones, the signal to noise ratio is obviously not as good. You can see that it's a little bit more noisy, but the fit does show that it's asymmetric still. So they still show the same shape. So all six of those objects are likely the same thing. Now, why are they actually going to be asymmetric? Well, we need to actually look at the fact that the object that's passing in front is not symmetric in shape. So like a planet, it, if we assume it's spherical, then we would expect the shape to be symmetric as it went across, but a, a comet is not. It's going to have a brighter region where the nucleus is, and then it's going to get more diffuse as you go towards the tail. So a comet is typically made up of an iron tail and a dust tail. Now the iron tail is optically thin, and it points away from the star because actually it interacts with the stellar wind because it's charged particles. So it always typically faces away from the star. And because it's quite optically thin, it's not very dense. With regards to the transit method, we're not really going to detect that part. What we do detect though, is the dust tail. So the dust tail is larger particles, more like dust, I suppose. And these actually lag the comet in its orbit. So if the comet goes across the star, we would expect the tail to always lag it. So that's why we get this typical shape that we do. And we would see this because this would be optically thicker. Uh, it would block out more light, basically. So why is it actually asymmetric? 
Well, here I've denoted the e the ingress, which is where the comet actually starts to pass in front of the the star, and this is the nucleus or the the denser part. The would it would be the brighter part basically, but actually because it's in front of the star, it's denser, it's smaller. So what happens here is you get a steeper and deeper transit. So the it blocks out light quite quickly, and then it blocks out quite a lot of light. Essentially, I say not a lot, but um, it's quite deep because it's optically thick. You can't see through the nucleus. Now, if we go to the tail half, once the tail starts to actually um, pass in front of the star, and I put the egress here because actually at this point here, the nucleus has already gone on the other side of the star, and you're left with just the tail. Now, the tail gets more optically thin as it gets further away from the comet. So what happens is it blocks out less light. But because the tail is much larger, it will have a much gentler slope. So it's basically shallower because well, it, it takes longer to transit across the star because it's physically bigger, but it's shallower because it's actually optically thinner. So it's not blocking out all of the light. So some of the light can get through. So what you get is this kind of much shallower and gentle slope from the tail and a sharper, deeper one from the actual nucleus or the front half of the comet. So thank you for watching and if you have any questions or any idea for future videos then just leave your comments in the bottom of the video.